Let's pray. Still in us, O Lord, any voice but your own. Amidst all the voices of this world that clamor for our attention, help us to hear you. That in hearing you, we may know your will. And in knowing your will, we may do it. That we might have life. Amen. Our reading tonight is Psalm 1. Psalm 1 is uh, the first of the Psalms. Did I surprise you? Have I left anybody behind yet? And uh, probably intentionally put there at the beginning to serve as an introduction for the whole collection of 150 Psalms. Perhaps this is familiar to you. Psalm 1. Blessed is the one who does not walk in the way of the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. This is the word of the Lord. This is not a particularly clever sermon title. I simply call it the way that reminds me in how I think of Psalm 1, which has been so important to me. But if you like a little catchier title, maybe a little catchier, it's the only New Year's resolution you'll ever need to make, is this psalm. Psalm 1 is intentionally introductory. It's probably written as a capstone to the whole after all the rest had been written and now being collected. How will we introduce this body of godly wisdom? Psalm 1 fills that role and kind of introduces the theme and sets us on the way that the rest of the psalms lead us further. The Psalms themselves are the songbook of ancient Israel, a hymn book. We're to sing it. The Psalms are the prayer book of the first people of God. Pray it. The Psalms are wisdom literature for the godly. We're to follow it. This Psalm fits that third category best. I'm not sure how you sing it. Maybe I think I know a little bit of how you pray it. But certainly there is wisdom here that I am to follow. And it starts with a blessed word. Blessed. That's both work and reward. The work that we're called to do is blessed and the reward that follows it. It's both the virtue and the consequences. The life lived, not without some of the most difficult of struggles, but there's a blessed life that also and always has the deepest of satisfactions. That's the life, the way, to which you and I are called. Not trouble-free, not even close. In fact, some more troubles precisely for having chosen this path. But the deepest satisfaction along the way, that's blessed. This is the life God created for me, commanded me to live, walks with me, and at its end, this is the way that he welcomes me home. Jesus begins his own teaching, the Sermon on the Mount, with blessed are, That's not an accident. Jesus taught as he was taught. The Psalm 1, blessed are. Who are the blessed? Well, they're those that walk in the way. When the people of God began in the book of Acts to follow Jesus intentionally and know that Jesus was the Savior to whom the world had, uh, who had been sent to the world, their first self-designation, our first self-designation as a people is the way. We referred to ourselves as the way. Again, not accidental. It's an intentional use of the language of Psalm 1. That path spoken about in that psalm, that's the path we are now newly on. 
But there's trouble along the way, those that would dissuade us. The scene is of a believer walking faithfully on a path, maybe not so well, maybe, maybe not at a particularly good pace, nothing to brag about here, maybe sometimes distracted from or confused along the way, but nonetheless walking on the way, wanting to and struggling to do this. The path itself is no doubt narrow and often enough difficult. So says Jesus in the Gospels when he teaches us. And someone also appearing to walk with the same commitment joins you as you walk along the way. But the thoughts and actions that this person offers are not of faithfulness. They're not how best to keep pace on the path. But they're about almost everything else, unfaithful things. Things which will undermine your will to continue walking. This person might come alongside you and offer to walk with you. Successful in his mission of walking alongside you, he persuades you to stop for a while and to talk about it. If Lois were here, she would tell you that this is an annoying habit of mine. Let's go for a walk. Let's get ourselves in shape. This being January 6th. Okay, that one's already gone away. But Lois will set the path, uh, will set the pace on, on which we walk. But I got to talk. I got undivided attention to my wife. She's right here. She actually left her phone in the car. I get her undivided attention. So you know what I do? I grab her elbow and I stop her. Like, you got to listen to this story. Let me tell you this. We went for a walk, and what I'm doing is stopping her all along the way. Lois doesn't walk with me anymore. <laughs> this person's successful in their mission with you. He persuades you to stop and talk a while. While doing so, you are now blocking the path for others who are also trying to walk on the way. This person might fill your soul with doubts, doubts about the wisdom of walking in this way at all. Finally, he persuades you to sit down. Stop walking altogether. To join him in scoffing at the poor souls who are still walking naively on the way. The way that you were once on, maybe just a moment ago. But now you're on the side and you're scoffing with others about the naive people who think that this path is the path or it's important to walk. You know, says the psalmist, Blessed is the one who does not walk in the way of the wicked. This is not to be your companion on the walk or stand in the street with sinners blocking the way of others or worst of all, sitting by the road and now scoffing. What's their problem, these scoffers? If you read the rest of the Psalms, I think you come to the conclusion, one of them is that the road is simply difficult. So why would you continue to do something that's so hard? Only the fool would continue on such a rigor, so far in excess of the value gained. David will expend many Psalms pleading his case before God that his enemies have borne false witness against him. They have bad mouth, the faith and the faithful, and they have railed against the final goodness of God. Having quit on the path themselves, they now attempt to dissuade others from it. David. In psalm after psalm, David affirms, these scoffers, though they be many, though they surround me, they will not dissuade me. I will trust in you. What's the effective strategy of the faithful to remain faithful on this path? To remain walking in the way? You might want to write this down. This is an astoundingly profound and brand new answer. You've never heard it. The Bible. Really. The advice in the psalm is don't listen to this guy. Listen to God. Who else knows this path? Who else is going to be your companion? Who else set you on it? Who else welcomes you at its end? Who else is this path? Meditating on God's word, delighting in the Lord, 
in the law of the Lord and meditating on his law day and night, thoroughly enjoying and being grateful for. The word meditate here is really the word ruminate. In, in Isaiah, Isaiah will talk that this is like a lion, like a young lion, he says, that growls over his prey. It's kind of like your dog with a bone. Gets the bone, he plays with it, he shows it off, he shows it to you, he won't let you have it, by the way. He shows it to you, backs off, goes off by himself, who knows what he does with this bone. He buries it, he digs it back up, he chews it, he's using tongue and teeth and inside and all of his guts to process this bone. That's what we're to do with the law of the Lord. Not merely thinking about it quietly, though that's welcome. Fully delighting in it. Chewing every last bit of taste out of it. You'll never exhaust it. You do this, and you will recognize that the rest of this stuff is just talk. And there's a, a world of difference between the Word of God The next metaphor changes completely. It's about tree and chaff. This person is a transplanted tree. Now near to an irrigation canal, the streams of the ancient Near Eastern desert. Every season it has fruit. Every year it grows younger, this tree. Firmly rooted, ever blossoming. Note, a tree does not eat its own fruit. It produces for the sake of others. Whatever this person does prospers. Think of that promise. Whatever this person does promise, prospers. Whenever she extends an effort, she gains her full reward. The plans she makes produce. The care she takes protects. The branching she ventures shades and beautifies. The blessed life she lives blesses. All around her are blessed because of her. Want that to be true? I don't know what I wouldn't trade for that one. This tree is the bold living silhouette on the bare desert landscape. You don't find many of these. It's opposite, chaff. Unseen stuff, really, unless you look. It's without significance, it's blown away, it's unstable, it's life draining. Did you catch the irony that those who walk on the way are like trees that are rooted down? And those who scoff persuaded that they're the heavyweights in the world, they really know how it works, are like chaff, so light they blow away with the wind. In the end, the wicked, the sinners, the scoffers, will not matter. They have no consequence. They make no difference. They were never there. They are the dust in the desert. Not to be noticed. Ignorable, they are to be ignored. And they will be ignored in the end. They will not be standing in the end, says the psalm. They'll not be standing with the righteous. They'll simply not be. But the righteous, the Lord knows their way. The word know here is, you know what this means, I think. It's about an intimacy. Adam knew Eve and they had a son and his name was Cain. The Lord knows the way of the righteous. This is the promise of an intimate life with our God. A lifelong and steady and near companion. Together, making life together. But the way of the wicked, it perishes. There was never a way it was never there. Note throughout the psalm, the wicked is plural. These things said of the wicked, wicked and their end is true of every one of them. 
But the righteous is always singular. The righteous one walks this path. It's words of intimacy, being personal, you know, constant companionship along the way. And it also refers to the righteous one. We Christians, from our beginning, have always understood Psalm 1 to speak also of our Savior, Jesus. He sets us on the way. He calls us to follow him on the way. He is the companion all along the way, and he is the way's destination. Indeed, he announces, I am the way. His word enlightens every step of ours along the way, including this word, Psalm 1. It's about Jesus. Yes, he learns from it. It's for Jesus. It's also from Jesus, for those who follow Jesus. Jesus, author of the psalm, Jesus, perfection of the psalm, Jesus walked by the light of the psalm and taught by it. Good enough for Jesus. Good enough. Paths are designated by their end. This is a, perhaps a hard truth. The roads are known by their ending points. You may have started off in Boston and then you wanted to come to Southern California. And somewhere along the way you find yourself in Kansas and you look for the name of the road. It won't say the Kansas road, though you're in Kansas. It's the California road. That's where you're going. So we're told the end of the paths. The end of this road It's death. If I walk it, I will die. The end of this road is life. If I walk it, I will live. Movement is inevitable. We will always be and are always becoming more of what we are, wherever we go. It moves from lust to adultery and hate to murder, from myself only to nothing at all, when myself is blown away like the chaff. Or it can be a commitment to others, becoming Christ to others, confidence in Christ, becoming a courageous faith. And myself in the end, on Christ's path, standing and blessed. Yes, there's a path that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is death. You've heard it. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've each turned to our own way, yes. Broad is the path that leads to destruction, and many there are that walk therein. Narrow is the path that leads to life. Few there are that walk therein. I am the way. What I'd like to persuade you of is that along the way, you make judgments about yourselves and others I, inevitably to remember that it's not the distance, it's the direction. This is how you were raised by your parents and how you at your best raise your children. Yes, yes, I know, a kid breaking a curfew by 10 minutes sounds like a small thing when you're a teenager. Like, really, did you have to go ballistic What's the difference between 10 o'clock and 10, 10? It's 10 minutes, Mom. Like, really? This is an issue? It's not the distance. I'm pretty close to home. It's the direction. The sense of disregard. The sense of, ugh. Still pretty close. But I'm beginning to turn away. And nothing is more fearful for a parent than to see the child turn away. But think of its opposite also. The child turned away long ago and now at a long distance away. The distance is great. It's lamentable. But at a great distance, 
you see the child begin to turn back. The distance is still great. Hasn't been overcome. But now the direction is corrected. The prodigal just starts off for home and is embraced. In this new year, if you have a sense that your distance cannot be overcome, that you've just walked a path for too long, the psalmist is not saying, boy, do you have a long way back. Good luck on that one. The psalmist says, begin to turn. Jesus is the way. He brings you all the way home. Do not worry about your distance from the things of God. Turn about. Walk this way. Direction matters. I've told this story before when I first came here. I think it was my first or second week here, a little over eight years ago, but I don't think I'll ever forget this story. Frankly, I was wondering about, you know, as you always do, you make a big decision. It's like, did I make the right one? Did I make the right one? And I find myself among a people who, I love you, complain about the weather in paradise. <laughs> really? I mean, really? And it's like, <laughs> you just, it's, it's foreign. This is a different place. Your pagans act differently than the pagans in the Midwest. I read this story in the paper, Union Tribune. Guy goes into Home Depot, wears an overcoat. Like, that's not suspicious. Who would wear an overcoat into Home Depot? Takes a bunch of stuff and puts it in the pockets and whatever, and he's kind of walking out like this, and they catch him. He drops the stuff off. He takes off. He runs. He gets to the end of the driveway outside the Home Depot. He's got to make a decision about which direction. Turn right or left. He's not familiar with the place. He decides he goes left. He goes left, and it's, it's a forced choice after that. He didn't know it. He has to turn left again and go kind of back up the side alley into a small neighborhood behind the Home Depot where he runs into a full battalion of the San Diego police SWAT team on training exercises. <laughs> no story has ever made me feel more at home like I'm still in Detroit than that one. Direction matters. I think the guy, as he sits now in prison somewhere, would rather have turned right. The psalm pleads with you. At the beginning of the collection of psalms, to set the direction right. The psalm pleads with you at the beginning of the year to set the direction now. Let me offer a little treat. Eugene Peterson is the author of The Message, which is a translation, his own, of the Bible, and there are parts of it that are just delightful. So this is, Eugene is somebody I know. He's a Presbyterian pastor, and he's written some great books. I recommend all of them to you. But I first read in The Message Psalm 1, and that's what made me think, like, this is a really interesting translation. I want to read the rest of it. Here's his translation of Psalm 1. Are you ready? How well God must love you. You don't hang out at Sin Saloon. You don't slink along Dead Id Road. You don't go to Smart Mouth College. Instead, you thrill to God's word. You chew on scripture day and night. You're a tree planted in Eden, bearing fresh fruit every month, never dropping a leaf, always in blossom. You're not at all like the wicked, who are mere windblown dust, without defense in court, unfit company for innocent people. God charts the road you take the road they take is skid row ready to make this new year's resolution walk on this path Jesus invites you let us pray Give us sufficient wisdom to choose well, sufficient courage to sustain our convictions and commitments, and sufficient grace to do well all along the way. 
and trust in you when we stumble. Have confidence in your loving tenderness toward us and your ability to lead us faithfully home. Amen.